Hi, my name is David Jung, and I'm one of the co-chief executives here at Beyond Our Borders. Today, I'm here with Mr. Marco Gutierrez, the founder for Latinos for Trump, and is also a developer and founder at Hidalgo, Hidalgo Properties. He's also the current VP of Operations at the American Dream Housing Agency. Marco, thank you so much for having us. Great to meet you. Thank guys. you. Before we get into the bulk of our questions, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your positions on immigration? Uh, a little bit about myself. Well, I was born and raised in Mexico. I came here when I was about your age, like probably guys. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a very unique uh, understanding of uh, what it, what it comes when it comes to my culture and, and immigration. When I came here, my, my you know my life was well, I actually was thinking of going back. I wasn't thinking of staying here. I wanted to just go to school and come back. But as I uh, spent more time here, I met my wife in high school, and this country sort of grew up on me. And I uh, I tell everybody that I had my first pizza here. I had my first root beer float. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a couple movies that my mom brought to Mexico, some of her trips, working here in the fields. Uh, the Goonies and uh, Coming to America with no subtitles. So I used to watch those movies again and again, probably a thousand times, trying to understand what, uh, what they were saying and trying to understand what America was like because mm -hmm. I knew my mom and my dad were here. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my stance on, imm on immigration is that there should be a, um, it needs to be fixed. There should be a welcome package, uh, sort of like a survival guide for people that come here mm -hmm. to help them integrate in, in a healthy way mm -hmm. into, into, the, um, into the country. Uh, some of my comments that were worldwide uh, recognize, I guess, taco trucks on every corner. It, it was really a, I, I tried to illustrate that, in what I said, my culture is very dominant, and, and it, is, it is true, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it is very dominant. And, and if we do not structure, um, I think things are gonna get out of hand, and you can see it in downtown LA, you can see it in downtown mm -hmm. Oakland, mm -hmm. that what survives is that the survival instincts, I think, of uh, people that come from uh, countries that are not developed yet are higher than the survival instincts of people here. And I think when, when Donald Trump talks that uh, they're, they're in a way, I don't say they're taking advantage. I think there's the, the words I use, it's imposing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, ba a bad thing that they're trying to survive, but then they might be hurting a little bit the local. Mm -hmm. uh, the I okay, thank you very much, yeah. So as we previously mentioned, and as we all know, you're the founder for Latinos for Trump. We know that during the campaign season, you guys put together a lot of different events, such as Operation Taco Bowl. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about what you guys did at Latinos for Trump during the campaign season and what these events entail? Yeah, I think that the inspiration behind Taco Bowl engagement, mm -hmm. which I declare September, yeah. the Taco Bowl uh, Awareness Month. <laughs> um, you know, I've been in business since I was five. Mm -hmm. I saw chiclets in Mexico. Oh. So um, I actually, Univision did a study uh, in 2001 about the Hispanic community and they were and immigrants that they were younger they were younger generation i think the average age at that time was 33. um and i remember because i was uh i was like five years behind the, the average mm -hmm. um when uh the emails leaked that what the dnc was doing and i think what the dnc was doing they were trying to copy donald trump's approach uh, with the Hispanic community, and they talk about they're they're the ones that talk about uh, more Taco Bell engagement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but what was very it, very um, interesting to me was that 
they actually had intel on my community that was very true. And again, um, I think the Hispanic community are very uh, territorial, very close. Uh, they were talking about the loyalty of the community. Uh, they were trying to say that we're very generational driven in what we uh, own our customs. So my mom in Mexico used uh, Pinot. Mm -hmm. uh, she came to the United States. She looked for Pinot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so there was some very good things, but I felt like they were taking advantage. Mm -hmm. And I felt that they were looking at us as a product rather than uh, to service or culture. Yeah. So I, I tried to ride the wave with that. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see how he reacted. I don't know what I did when I said taco trucks on every corner, but I hit the spinal cord of, of the community. When you talk about tacos in my culture, it's something that it's like you're talking, a, it's like a divine message. <laughs> you know? yeah. Because if, if you go to any fiesta, any party in my culture, mm -hmm. um, food is so essential. Uh, my grandmother had 21 kids, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and I was talking to somebody wow. yesterday from that generation that had 16 kids. Uh, so my grandmother spent her whole day at the kitchen. Mm -hmm. In the morning, five in the morning, she would get up, she would start doing all the, the um, they call the nistamal, the, 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 the corn to make tortillas. So when I woke up, the smell of coffee and, and homemade tortillas, so it's very, a very nurturing environment to be in, and I think it's very hard for us to get out of it. So when I talk about taco trucks, everybody understands that message, mostly about tacos. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, it was, uh, I felt like the DNC was sort of taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of counter attacked their, um, their message and it worked. Mm -hmm. So what we did is um, uh, we did uh, the Anaheim rally, uh, which was one of the first ones. So that sort of like brought us together as um, Hispanics. But throughout the campaign, what I saw is that there's very few uh, naturalized immigrants that participate in the um, political process or first generations. Most, most of them were second generation um, people. So my goal is to invite some of that first generation, which is, I think is what's hurting the most, because you have a lot of kids that I think they feel guilty to be American. They kind of feel that because their parents haven't integrated, um, and because the parents haven't integrated, they, they have this sort of like resentment. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand that resentment because I had that resentment when my parents came here. Uh, I was 14. They came to work in the fields. And I was without parents for three, four years. Mm -hmm. So my family was separated. They would go back on, on Christmas. So in a way, I, was, I had resentments against the United, <laughs> United States of America. You know, they took my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think these kids, in a way, they feel resentment that Donald Trump is throwing all these things at immigrants, and they're saying, wait a minute, my parents are immigrants, how come he doesn't like them? Uh, but they really don't know what to do e either. Mm -hmm. And I hope that with this, they get involved and yeah. do something about it. That's definitely true. So uh, bouncing off of your earlier statement regarding the DNC involvement in the Hispanic community, the Hispanic community in our country is predominantly liberal, with over 66% of the Latino vote going to Hillary Clinton the last election cycle, as opposed to just 28% for now President Trump. As a Latino supporting Mr. Trump during the campaign, what part of his message resonated with you then and convinced you that he was a leader that was better for your community and the country as a whole? I have been um, a Republican Mm -hmm. since I became a, a, a U.S. citizen. Uh, I think what resonated the most is the commerce. 
uh, the approach to, to the, the economic approach of Trump, and also the, uh, I guess you could say, the conservative values that the, the, the Republican Party has. Mm -hmm. um, If um, if you look in the 2008, um, when we had that uh, recession, uh, I think that, actually going back to 2001, 2003, in the industry in which I work, there was a website, uh, it was called Gomez.com, I don't know if Gomez.com is still on, but they were saying that the number one buyer, real estate buyer in that time, uh, in the tense uh, first surnames, they were Hispanic. Sanchez, Martinez, uh, Gomez. Well, in the recession in 2008, who, uh, the number one loser was the Hispanics mm -hmm. because they're the ones that bought all those homes. Um, I don't think really most Hispanics have really uh, come out in, in and show the support, but I think it's higher than that. I think there's a lot of Trump supporters that are still in the closet. Mm -hmm. um, you can see it with Bush, I think it was like 40%. And there was another um, article that says that it's higher than 28%. It's mm -hmm. more like... But I think that as Hispanics uh, integrate into culture and they're able to share their moral and cultural values into this country, mm -hmm. I think you're going to see that there is either, they're either going to identify Republican or conservative, but they're going to support the um, conservative movement more. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you touched on the next question with, our ans uh, with your answer, but as we alluded to in the previous question, much of the Latino population, especially in the Bay Area, is against President Trump, feeling as though you will only hurt, not help the Hispanic population. So you have taken a different approach, as you've just mentioned. Um, there, a lot of them are closet. A lot of them don't see the true benefits of his policies yet. But what do you in see in Mr. Trump's uh, current immigration policy and attitude towards Latinos in general that the rest of the Latino community is not yet seeing or admitting, especially after many of the negative generalizations he has made about the people in Mexico? You know, I was talking to somebody from Mexico yesterday, actually. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that were very angry with me, they, were, they felt so insulted. And I was trying to figure out why, why are we as Hispanics so offended? Um, and this guy actually, he insulted me last year, but now he's actually talking to me. You know what he said? He said that Donald Trump is actually going to be the um, cause for the second independence of Mexico, mm -hmm. meaning that actually uh, the Mexicans in Mexico are getting together, and they're uh, so he's actually making Mexico great again. Uh -huh. um, I guess water runs downhill. I guess you know what he is pushing for here, it, the Mexican government uh, is is because they're so angry at Donald Trump. And, and then I think the, the Trump administration, not so much the Trump administration, but the, the Republican Party, they're very scared that actually there's going to be a left-wing uh, president in Mexico, which is the guy that's ahead right now, mm -hmm. Mr. Lopez Obrador. Mm -hmm. um, the benefits that I think that a lot of Hispanics are going to get out of what's going on with Trump, I guess... It's mainly economic, mm -hmm. and uh, you have because really the people that are trying to get ahead here are the ones that are have been hurt. You, you can see if you research, there is a lot of Hispanics that went bankrupt in 2008. So the message of Donald Trump to restore the economy, bring jobs and all that, it, it, it helps. And I think once Hispanics start to see that, they're gonna see past the insults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can see past the insults, really, because I, you know, I, I can only imagine what the job of Donald Trump is. I mean, he's trying yeah. to, 
and like he says, he is the president for America. He's not the president of Mexico. I, for some reason, we keep being so um, interested in what Mexico would say rather than what the American people mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any concerted effort together uh, through leaders in your community in order to better help uh, closeted members who might not feel comfortable with their positions? We do not have a structure that you can say uh, would service all this new commerce. But we are, uh, like for example, I have my friend in, in Texas. Um, she was able to position herself with her RNC on what's called an enga a Hispanic engagement um, outreach. Mm -hmm. So she's she created a tour, and she's going around the state of Texas, bringing. Uh, it's called the listening tour. Actually, just listening to what people have to say, and we have got a lot of information on how to, to, replicate this in other states. So yeah, I'm I'm interested in doing something like that. But there is nothing that we can attach ourselves to, and not even for the Americans really. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like the wild wild west I think here in in, in California, and, and uh, it's an uphill battle. Um, because you can see that on the liberal side, they have their ground. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you. So um, thank you for that answer. So bouncing off that question, you are an immigrant and you know the hardships involved in the legal process. Of course, it's very complicated. Uh, one of our previous, previous interviewees uh, compared immigration law to our very complicated health care system. So, Given that, doesn't it seem almost expected that some people would turn to illegal immigration as another means of entering the country when there are so many current flaws with the immigration process and all the complexities it has? I think people turn to that um, illegal way of coming here because of what is the result of the way things are happening. I think that, again, if we did a uh, If we would all take responsibility, they want, they got the people that are coming here um, legally or illegally to see the the, uh, the benefits of doing things right because people are risking their lives uh, crossing the border. Uh, people are risking their their to live in a soft culture environment status by coming here illegally. Um, they live in fear. They don't. They're not adjusted. Uh, I think uh, we have to fix the problem that we have here before we can. Again, it starts at home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the reaction of, of the Americans is that th things have gotten out of hand. You know, and and there is. There is just no way we're going to allow more people to come here when we have a problem at home that hasn't been fixed. We talk so much about illegal people that are here, but we don't talk about the people that are in the process to become legal, which is probably just as many or more. Uh, and some of those are losing their um, green card because they don't understand the culture, mm -hmm. because they drink and drive, uh, which in Mexico is not a problem. <laughs> you can drink and drive. <laughs> uh, domestic violence, I think, is, is one of the biggest, it's an epidemic right now, not just on the Hispanic community, but the Hispanic community is leading that. And, you know, a lot of, in, in my country, a country of origin, uh, you scream at the wife, it's not as, you know, it's, they don't, it's not as bad. But here, you, if I scream at my wife and my neighbor hears that, they're gonna call the police and they're gonna arrest me. And if I have a green card, they're probably gonna take it away from me. So, I think that's the biggest problem. What are we doing about all those people that are losing? They're not, they're not going back to Mexico. They're just taking their green card away. And they're going to stay here because they already have a house. They are, already have a family. 
So I think we should fix that uh, that community here first before we get more people in. We have made a mistake, but maybe I came here by mistake. Out of the amnesty, out of four million people that Reagan was able to help, which where my parents were in that pack. Um, where are those four million people at? I'm probably one of the only ones that are helping the conservative movement. Everybody else dropped the ball. They're going against the conservative value. And a lot of them they took it for granted. They, they, they um, felt complacent. They didn't finish the process. I talked to people that didn't even want to, to get their, their uh, all they had to do is go to apply for their uh, green card, and they didn't. So I don't think it's that so much the complexity of the immigration um, process. I think it's a lot of the lack of passion uh, for people to take advantage of something so beautiful like, like I did and to follow the, the path for citizenship. You know, when you talk to a Cuban, uh, when you talk to somebody from Nicaragua, these guys are so passionate that they are able to be in the United States. I mean, I think they love the United States more than the people that were born here because they know what it is to not have that. Um, I don't think I'm as passionate as the Cubans. Uh, I'm not that angry at Mexico. I, I Going back, uh, I wish more people would just stay there and try to make Mexico great again rather than coming up here and face adversity uh, the way they do. Um, but hey, uh, I think that we're getting to a, a point where there's just so many of us uh, right now and, and uh, there's no leadership. You have the Hispanic, I have six kids. <laughs> I keep saying that, huh? And I keep saying that because if there is really 60 million of us here and they all have six kids. I mean, you're looking at 200 million people in the next generation, or two generations, and we have no leadership. So what are we gonna do? Bring more? I think we need to fix the ones that are here first. Okay, I see. So uh, we touched on legal immigration, so let's go on to that straight away. Uh, just two days ago, President Trump supported a bill cutting legal immigration by half by reforming the green card process. Um, they're switching to a merits-based system, which is different from the current system we have in place. As an advocate for Trump's immigration policy, how can you uh, justify this move when he is going after the people doing nothing wrong coming here legally? A lot of people, when they think of illegal immigration, they think of farming, they think about picking up. I, I, when you drive, you can see all the fields there, and I, I uh, como se dice, les pito, les... I, I honk at them, because as I did that in Mexico, I, I, I picked in, um, uh, you know, I picked high ha harvest, they say. Um, so I really love those people that are doing that. But you know what, you have a lot of people here that immigrated that are not doing that, that they're just sitting in their couch uh, doing nothing. We should get those guys to go farm. Because we should say, are you going to participate on this, uh, on this experience? Because they're being a bad example. Now, we're going to get more to just come here and do the same? Um, I don't know. I think that uh, it makes sense what you're saying. But in a way, I think that if we keep putting more um, into this, and again, a lot of people think that um, coming to America legally is you're gonna immediately have the ticket of being, you're gonna have the golden ticket to be a, a, a citizen. A lot of people do not know that it's a 10 year process, that you have to be eligible and you have to show good character, you have to go through mental evaluation, psychological evaluation, and then you will become a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are not following through with their 
For example, um, a lot of people are self-deporting right now. Or a lot of people are just going back to Mexico because they don't like the climate, uh, the, the Donald Trump. Uh, some of those people have papers. So we gave a visa, we gave a legal resident status to some people that are going back to Mexico. We could have gave that to somebody else that is really going to be committed to being here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. But going more into that, there are a lot of people who have, you've mentioned the green card process is very, very difficult. My parents are immigrants. They use a green a card process to get into the country. It's a very strenuous um, immigration system. But given that it's so precise and make sure that we vet the best immigrants for our country, shouldn't we be increasing the number of immigrants entering our country rather than closing our doors? Because for the last few decades, we've been steadily increasing our immigration to the country. And this is the first administration that has reversed that trend. But shouldn't we allow for more cultural diversity going into the future? The thing is that we already have the cultural diversity. We are, it's already here. A lot of people think that uh, our team is not, our team is already complete. A lot of people think that we need more players. Um, I think that uh, the United States is like one of the only countries that allows so many people to come here every year. Uh, I was reading that in Mexico, in the last two years, three years, there was only fifteen thousand citizens that were naturalized. When you compare that to two million, uh, the United States has been very generous. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if people around the world would understand that we're having problems, uh, it's not, it's only a temporary, and, and, it, and it's not even what it is, it's just what the president wants. You know, we still have to pass, and still, I feel that we put so much. Um, attention on on what Donald Trump wants than what's really happening. Uh, he, he wants America first, and I think that that's just the message that, uh, mm -hmm. you know what happened in the in dark ages, um, the very uh, roads that the Roman Empire built to bring Rome to the to the world, those very roads were the cause of their collapse. Mm -hmm. the, the, the very people that we're bringing here to enrich our country could be the reason of our collapse. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a, a safety measure that Donald Trump's trying to implement and just trying to and what what gets me is why people get so angry. You know, it's it's especially with the wall. Let's talk a little bit about the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's it's like if I want to build a wall in my house. If I, I mean, why why is the world gets so angry about a wall that's been? It's like we don't have the ability to build a wall in our own home. It's it's just it's nuts. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that if Mexico was the overachiever in this equation, Mexico didn't even think twice to build a wall. So uh, the U.S. is, of course, a different country because it's known for being a nation of immigrants from our founding fathers, them being immigrants, and our constant flow of immigration throughout the 19th, 19th century, the 20th century, and even in the 21st century. We've always been have had our doors open. So given that fact, is it about time that we start closing our doors and start focusing on our internal problems? And do you think that's the right approach for our country? I don't think it's the right approach. I think it's the only approach that we should take right now. The, the founding fathers were not immigrants, they were settlers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the way the Constitution was set up, it, it, I don't think it was set up for the whole world to have it, come here and camp. Uh, Ankle chair, which I don't like her very much because she has never anything good to say about Hispanics. But she said something that caught my attention, and she said that the United States 
for a long time, for 200 years, was really uh, composed of blacks and, 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 and white people. It was a binary, so it was a symbiotic relationship between those two ethnic groups. And then along came Polly, meaning that we came later, and now we want to tell them how, what, how to do things. And they're, they're wait a minute, I mean, we, it, it's just, it, it really does, if you think about it, really, really think about it, it's like you and I, we create a company, we create the, a culture, uh, uh, an environment, and then other people come in, and then later they want to just change our rules because they think they know better. I, I, I see the, the founding fathers or the founders, I don't think they, they, they meant for this to uh, be the way it is, but I, I think we're not a nation of immigrants. I think we're a nation, I, a lot of people get mad at me when I tell them we're a nation of immigrants because my kids were not immigrants, they were born here. I'm, I am an immigrant, but when I came here, this was already here, and people took this, this, this culture, America, thanks to the founding fathers, um, they took me in, they fed me, they gave me an education, mm -hmm. uh, they gave me a wife, they gave me six kids, they gave me an opportunity to be here. I don't want to go and tell them how to do things. And hey, I, I want to bring every, all my cousins, which is about a hundred. And I want to bring. I mean, I don't. I, don't, I can't just impose that on, on on the Americans. Don't quote me on this, but in the the Egyptians, they have like seven states of consciousness for somebody to be considered a citizen. Um, I don't remember all of them, but I know that before justice, you have to master love. Uh, because without love, there's no justice. Uh, it's very hard for me to come here and demand that I want to be a citizen if I haven't walked the walk. I, I tell a lot of people that um, knowledge of the path is not a substitution for walking it. It's very, it's very hard to give a people a ticket to come here if they're not prepared. And I think that at the end, let's let's put it this way: I don't think we are prepared to to accommodate all these people to be a to be a, a um, host. Does that make sense? To be a host, a como se dice un huésped. I guess. Does that answer my question? I don't know. I think it's more of an opinion than. <laughs> No, no, it's it's fine. And I think um, you mentioned one of the barriers of entry, which would be the border wall on our southern border with Mexico. So one large aspect of Trump's immigration policy has been the border wall with Mexico, and Trump campaigned on building this wall. Uh, but just last week, uh, Congress appropriated taxpayer dollars towards building this wall, and then instead of having Mexico paid for it, do you see a bigger and better solution to this issue that is more cost efficient in stopping illegal immigration? I think the wall is, has been the most effective uh, solution there has ever been, and it hasn't even been built. Mm -hmm. Not one brick has been laid on that, and you have 78% reduction on legal crossings. Mm -hmm. So I think the wall is a must. It's, it's a, a, um, it's a symbolic, symbolic um, the, um, way to set boundaries um, there is a, a, a lot of uh, things that happen at the border that we're, we don't know of you just saw those um, what, how many people were in that truck oh, nine people nine people died mm -hmm. uh, that's just what was leaked to the news but uh, that that, hap that happens all the very time very common mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think you know I think that uh, we definitely need to see a way to deter that. So given the, there's a lot of cost uh, problems with building the wall, many have touted that uh, a quote unquote digital wall could be built more integrated with higher level technology than just a traditional concrete wall. And there are already fences 
on our southern border? How can we ensure an effective solution that is cost efficient for our taxpayers? It, I've seen that they're going to do a, um, they have a model where they're going to do a, como se dice, uh, uh, panels, solar panels with the wall, and I think that's uh, going to help a lot. Um, I think that with the benefit that the wall brings, the cost is nothing, really, when, when you think about it. Have you seen, there is a movie called The Labyrinth, and if you have time, watch it, because there is this little animal that's trying to cross this bridge. It's like a little skunk, what it, uh, yeah. So th these people want to cross that bridge, and then he comes out and, with his sword and he says, I have sworn on my life that nobody would pass this bridge without my permission. And these people want to cross the bridge, so they start fighting with him. <laughs> and he, he just keeps fighting. And he says, no, I have sworn on my life that nobody would pass this bridge without my permission. And finally, at the end, when they can't beat him, then the girl thinks and says, well, can we have your permission? And the little guard of the bridge is, I, nobody has asked me that, I suppose, go ahead. So I think it's just about asking, um, the wall is for, to, to invite people to come here the proper way. The, the, don't you think that's pretty much what it says, you know, there is a wall here, you shouldn't pass. Yeah, so um, thank you for elaborating on the uh, what symbolic means in terms of the wall. But an, another issue that's coming up is that many people have, uh, that many people have with Trump is that they feel that he sometimes makes up his own facts. For instance, he has constantly stated that there are 30 million undocumented immigrants in our country when countless reputable sources have suge suggested a far lower number, such as the Pew Research Center and the Cato Institute, which, su which suggests a number around 11.3 to 11.5 million undocumented immigrants. Why do you believe President Trump avoids these numbers and facts when they're so clearly presented to him? And do you believe that he has additional sources where he may be getting his own numbers? You know, when it comes to Trump, uh, the way he speaks, I have a very unique understanding of it because I've been in sales for, since I was five again, and Often salespeople, we always talk in open-ended scenarios. Um, it, it, Donald Trump shouldn't be talking so much like that because now he's the president. Every word he says, it's it, it's it has to be fact-checked. But I think he's just um, trying to illustrate the 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 situation because for 30 years and i talked to a lot of people they have been saying 11 million for 30 years and then we go again to the same thing um these people have are bringing their friends are bringing their cousins are bringing their family so that number has grown and, and it, it has to be more but i don't know who the reputable uh, um sources nowadays because I've been just I've been talking to uh, journalists and people that are in the business of reporting and, and the, it seems that nobody knows uh, what the real number is I mean it's so hard to see that they're really uh, accounting for people that are off the system you know mm -hmm. so how to do you have a, that, that statistic? Do you have a, 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 a year? Uh, when was that study made? But I don't have that specifically right now, but um, I can provide you that statistic. After the so he said that there was 30 million? He didn't say that there was 30 million. 2016, yeah. The study, uh, Pew the study uh, Pew Research. For the Pew, Pew Research Center. But, but Donald Trump said that there was 30 million illegal uh, The campaign trail, he's been saying 30 million, something like that. So I understand he speaks and uh, kind of like as an advertiser, as a salesman. So he sometimes exaggerates some concepts. Uh, but 
as the president of the United States, do you think he should tone back some of the campaign rhetoric that he's been using and stick more to established sources? That would be on a perfect world. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, that would be an ideal world. But I think that the opposition and, and the... The way the deep, you know, they call it deep state, uh, are fighting him. I think he has no choice but to to go back to basics, and that's why he's continuing to do these rallies. And I was listening to his rally last night, and he's getting so good at it. Uh, he's really uh, itemizing and, and, and bringing the message uh, at the base of what he campaigned on, like. He talked about the DNC that they have no, they have no message, they have no agenda, they have no vision. Uh, if there is somebody that has vision, is Donald Trump, and you, is he a CEO? You know, and, and an essential uh, component of being a CEO is having a vision, uh, the culture and, and the strategy to to make it happen. And so they're not gonna go. They're not gonna. Um, they're not going to be able to silence Donald Trump if they continue to fight him that way. Because I think if they keep poking the bear, he's going to continue. And, and this is a person that speaks about the hierarchy of needs of the, everybody. Uh, my dad, who's a Mexican national, he's never, uh, he's never, he never tried to become a citizen, uh, understands him. My son, who's seven, understands Donald Trump, except for my daughter. But uh, I think Donald Trump should continue to be Donald Trump. He should just uh, give us that experience of what it is to have somebody like him to be a president. Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to deny that experience to ourselves, too. Yeah, we have the right to be wrong. If Donald Trump wasn't the person that to be the president, we, we sh we're gonna know. But I think people are spending more time in being destructive rather than being constructive. And I, th I think that's a very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care, you see in business, we always say this, people don't care how much you know until they, they know how much you care. So if you don't care for me, I don't care how many experts and the statistics and all these things you have because I'm not going to listen to it. And I think that's what the average citizen feels out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can bring me uh, any experts of anything, but if I don't have food on the table and the basic needs to take my kids through college or, or through school and to live every day uh, a useful life, then I really can't, I can care less about the rest. That's what I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I understand that this is not essentially your area of expertise, but let's briefly talk about another aspect of President Trump's immigration policy, and that's the Middle East. He has supported a travel ban for Muslim countries. It's being debated as we speak. Many people have trouble standing by this idea because it feels discriminatory, and especially because it has been reported that he has left countries off the list that he has business ties with. Would you, mean, would you mind speaking to us a little bit about this topic? First of all, those countries where um, Obama is the one that picked those countries. I mean, it's, it's something that's been already working for a while. Um, I think that Donald Trump, in his speech about that, he said that some countries have a... a they don't have a government that you could trust. They don't have a, a way of uh, of supporting their 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 side of the bargain, I guess. And I think that the countries that have um, been taken out of the list or are not in the list are countries that have actually reached out to to work things out in in a in a successful way. Um, and about the ban and all that, I, I really, I question the motives again of the people that are so angry about this because if I was going to come to this country and you tell me, Marco, you can't come here for 90 days 
because of whatever reason, I would understand it if I'm in that country. I've been suspended from a job before. Uh, I, it, 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 it's just, um, as a citizen, I need to trust that the, the president that we elected has a specific knowledge or understanding that's necessary, that, that, that I should trust. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I under completely understand where you're coming from. But uh, when we're actually talking about Syrian refugees, uh, not just people who want to come to the country for fun or for a job, but because they're in desperate need of protection. These people immigrating to the U.S., needing that refugee status or the asylum status, shouldn't those people be prioritized, especially since that there hasn't been dramatic crime rates for any Syrian refugees in the past few years? What I hear and what I just, I'm like, I'm very, I'm not familiar with this at all, is um, if you look into Europe with all this refugee migration, there is major issues that are going on. Uh, and then I question also why a lot of the Arab uh, countries are not uh, being open arms about bringing these people in either. Um, I, I, I really don't know what to say there. I think that Donald Trump campaigned on a message that he was going to do extreme betting. It's something that it's necessary because of the what has happened before, and they say that past behavior predicts future behavior. Um, we need to uh, we need to stay vigilant of what we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. Not so much for what has happened, but what could happen. Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to the international stage, of course, the U.S. is seen as a humanitarian leader. So uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries that have reached out and a helping hand to Syrian refugees and other refugees in the area has been Jordan, as a uh, memorable one, and Germany through Angela Merkel, as well as France. So given that these world leaders in humanitarian efforts have been adamant about protecting refugees, should the Americans as, a world, uh, as the leader of the free world take that same position or should we focus on our internal issues first? Again, we should work with our internal issues, but then my wife and I, we love France. We have been there a couple of times. Um, you are, I think they're going too fast. They're gonna, it's gonna affect their, demo, their uh, demographic in a way that they're losing their, their identity as a country. It, 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 I think, should um, we should caution on that um, we are the we we might be a, a it's probably okay just going back it's because we are the leader we don't want to lose that status because I think that's what's happening with the uh, with France it's just it's hard mm -hmm. it, I don't know if you've seen a lot of the what's going on over there but it's just uh, the streets don't look the same Mm -hmm. Chancellor say is just going down. There is uh, bombs everywhere. There is uh, things that are happening that we don't want them to happen here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. But hasn't the historic pattern been as we start turning inwards, as we start uh, becoming less integrated with the globe or the world around us, we become more secluded to world affairs. For instance, on energy policy, President Trump has been trying to go back to uh, not alternative energy such as clean energy, but going back to coal and oil. And that has actually put us at a disadvantage against countries like China or emerging leaders in the energy industry. Shouldn't we continue to focus our efforts on being an international leader while still handling our problems uh, here and abroad? Definitely, I think we should. But the thing is that, um, again, I think that the the way things are happening, um, it's, uh, Donald Trump used a word that actually, uh, in Mexico, I used to use it a lot, the reciprocal, reciprocal, reciprocidad. 
Um, we should uh, we should have healthy relationships, healthy business relationships where it's a win-win, you know. And, and I think that what's going on right now, Donald Trump, he he is a businessman, and he's not going to do anything that. It's not going to um, give us the benefit of uh, uh, the return and value of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's definitely true. So a few questions to wrap things up. There's been a lot of talk of immigration and President Trump's policy as a whole over the course of his relatively new po uh, presidency. But this is a new presidency and there's a long ways to go. How do you anticipate that going into the future uh, support for President Trump's uh, policies will grow or dissipate in the coming years, and how do you think, uh, and why do you think that will be happening? I think one of the biggest things that I've been waiting for is to see what he's going to do with DACA, because mm -hmm. I think that's going to uh, put a lot of weight on on the way people are looking at uh, immigration. Um, Again, I think the support for Donald Trump, it's, it's, so, it's very solid. And I think it'll just grow. Mm -hmm. uh, he, has, he has spoken to the silent majority. I mean, he has spoken to a need. Americans are tired of being tired. They, they are uh, definitely uh, committed to, 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 to being... Uh, there for Trump. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he has uh, been a very effective leader of, of this voice, the voice uh, of, of the people. Um, immigration, I, don't, I know we, we, uh, we always go back. Immigration is probably one of the biggest issues right now. But I think that definitely if you could, if you see that he's talking about America first, it's good for the immigration too because then the immigrants that are going to come here, they're going to come to a solid America. They, they need to play their part in, in supporting that this experience of being American needs to be uh, safe, needs to be nurtured from the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, definitely true. You know, when I saw that the Goonies going back to the movie The Goonies, <laughs> I was very, um, I was very touched by that message. And then you can see people from all all the countries that love. I mean, they love rock and roll. They love the internet. They love all this. They should help us continue to have this, and we have this because of the way America has been, you know, because of well, the ambition to, to have. We don't want to lose it. I mean, I, with the experience that I had in 2008 with the, with the uh, collapse of the markets, there was moments that I thought that we were really going to a path that I don't think we could have come back from it. So uh, regarding the 2008 financial crisis, I know that it was somewhat of a transformative experience for you, as you've mentioned in previous interviews. Uh, but given that President Trump, although he has many good economic policies on his platform, he's stacked his administration full of many um, of the people who caused the financial meltdown because of reckless lending through the banks. But shouldn't the president, as a voice of the American people, as you've stated, uh, support the American people instead of incorporating more high-level individuals from large corporations? You know, um, what was that movie, Mr. Huge? No, where, where you know how the um, FBI, when they find this a criminal, they hire him rather than uh, because they need... Oh, catch expert. me if you can. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the people that are uh, the best to fix this economy are the ones that cost, that help. Like, for instance, and I am a mortgage expert. Mm -hmm. um, I indirectly participated in, in the uh, f originating of a lot of loans that went belly up. I'm probably the best person to fix it because I 
did it. So I think Donald Trump did the best hiring all those people. Now, we need to watch them closely and see how they uh, they use their wisdom. Um, but you can see that Donald Trump doesn't has, hesitate in, in, in turning and in firing somebody. So mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, if they start If they start using their going to the bad bad um, habits, we're probably gonna be able to see that right away. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's like definitely Mr. true. Mister uh, Scaramucci, you know, Mister mm -hmm. Scaramucci, great guy, great personality, very aggressive uh, businessman, but I think he just went a little too far, and I think Donald Trump had a really good uh, chance of getting somebody to shake people up but then also you have the, the you have the reputation of the white house mm -hmm. so so many of these obama era policies such as policing um the financial industry have been implemented over the last few years and he's been strict more strict on uh some of the regulations that are going on but President Trump, once he's entered office, has stripped many of these regulations, um, and his administration as a whole has moved them. So how can we ensure that we protect American interests, even though that there are less protections available for everyday uh, customers? You know, you touched um, on, a, on a great subject there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Obama crippled a small business with uh, his uh, regulations, and especially the that, the that Frank. I have a mortgage friend that had to pay $50,000 for loans he funded, and these people paid off their, their, they sold their homes or they paid them off. So he had to pay all the commissions and the credits back. That is crazy, mm -hmm. because, because without the that Frank, you, you can have a prepayment penalty on a mortgage right now. Um, I can't wait for that to be taken away because then there's going to be more money. Banks are going to be willing to lend again because right now banks don't want to lend money because of all the regulations. They're going to get more in trouble then. It's not going to be profitable for them. Um, I think we need to be careful in how fast we do this because if you read any uh, economics, uh, any industry, that real estate economics, on the second first chapter it says that you move money through high commissions there is just no other way mm -hmm. if you pay enough money paul will sell to paul will make sure that john sells to whoever um right now there's just no motivation on that especially mm -hmm. uh i mean the, i've talked to physicians that close their practice because of all the regulations. I've talked to, uh, who's that person? A therapist, a physical therapist. I mean, the, the industries were shocked everywhere. Um, yeah, you're right. We need to be careful on how fast or how business comes back. But um, the, uh, the idea that we are going to, we're not going to be able to survive much, survive much longer. And I can tell you this because I talk to a lot of people um, that are out there trying to, I talk to a lot of people in, in financial hardship because my function right now uh, is I am a um, hardship evaluator, a financial hardship uh, I help with people get a healthy household, reactivate themselves economically mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Like, for instance, we have um, guidelines that tells us that nobody should spend more than 30% of their income, disposable income, in a mortgage or a home. That's where everything starts. If you pay more than 30%, then something else is gonna go wrong. You're not gonna be able to have pizza on Fridays. Mm. You're not gonna be able to go on vacation.
because you're paying more for your mortgage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people go there, but they shouldn't. So I think um, we need to educate people to not spend more than they make. But at the same time, we need to motivate people to go out there and, 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 and dream again and have the confidence to restore the American dream. Because mm -hmm. that confidence went away. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm going out of subject here, but let me, let me just tell you, when I met Jennifer, her family had this medium, you know, um, this home. People took so much pride on their houses, on their homes. They work very hard. So now our new generation, like you guys, you guys come and, and then when people lost their homes, what can we teach our generation? Oh, work hard so you can have a home and lose it. It's, it's, it's not something very uh, attractive. Mm. And so I think it's very hard for us to, bring, to tell our kids to to dream, to hope, to, to, to go out there. And, and so we need to use the experience and make sure that with all these regulations that are going to be um, taken out so that we can continue to do business, I think there's gonna be a generation, like, like for instance in the depression times. If you meet anybody that lived through the depression, these people are so freaking cheap that they 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 won't they won't uh, they will just uh, they're frugal. And those people, I could never sell a mortgage, an adjustable mortgage, to somebody that lived through the depression. They would not buy it because they had already lost their homes. Then, so I think that a lot of people are gonna learn from the mistakes. And that's why I love Donald Trump so much, because this, you have a guy that used to, that uh, they were paying him 500,000, more than Bill Clinton, to, to speak about business. Now this guy is giving, giving us this for free, to you and, and, and to me. I mean, I, I, I can appreciate that you guys have a, a liberal approach to the, the political process, but, Take the good and leave the rest. Donald Trump has very good features, bells and whistles that you guys can learn from to 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 uh, to help yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're gonna have this generation of all these people that went bankrupt, that uh, lost their homes, and that are gonna be able to go back into the market again and reclaim the American dream. And through their experience, they're gonna be able to help themselves not to go there again and chew more than they can, what do you say? Buy more than you can chew and help you guys, the new generation, to tell you, hey, <laughs> just uh, be careful, you know? Yeah. Because when you guys are rich and famous, you guys are gonna need somebody like me, like somebody that went through this recession to help you deal with it. Thank you for so much for sharing so many different perspectives um, of your own unique perspective. Uh, just to wrap things up, if there is one aspect of President Trump's immigration policy you could disagree with, as we're all humans, we're not uh, we're not subservient to every single view. Which one would you change, and how would you make it better? <laughs> you know, um, I know that um, there's a lot of people that are listening to me right now, but. There was a meme that said, uh, forget about weed, legalize, legalize my mom. <laughs> did you ever read that? No, I, I did not. <laughs> uh, and then there was another one that said, uh, deport, uh, deport everybody, but don't report the taco track, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I think that this DACA kids, uh, deserve uh, to be listened to. Um, I think that we should all take a uh, response, uh, take our, what do you call it, our, take responsibility for, for our own actions. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, I am not an immigration officer, so I, I am not trying to see out there who is legal and who's not. Uh, that's not. I wish for everybody to be legal. Uh, I think that we have uh, we have allowed ourselves to be in a world of uh, this boundaries and, and but you know there is a business to be run too and, and uh, there is people that are suffering because of where we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just the last question: uh, What would you tell people who may be misunderstanding uh, President Trump's policy and his actions on immigration and? How can we better understand the president's actions for the greater good of our country? I think that, you know, when you take, I I remember listening to Obama one time, and he said that, uh, you know, Obama was really good at, very eloquent at explaining things, but he said that every issue that came to his desk was a hardship. Uh, So if people just try to be a little compassionate to Trump and understand that all these issues are hardship issues and like any hardship you need to just you need to see you, you said something at the beginning to see things objectively and to see really what's going on and try not to uh, let this the emotions run because I, I need to really see, see, we talk about people being deported. I haven't heard around me of anybody that has been deported. So I really don't know what the real, uh, what what's really, really happening out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, when Obama was, I heard a lot of people around me being deported. My uncle was deported. So... I heard more people being deported during the Obama administration than now. So I think in a way, and I used to say this when I was attacked by the media and I was just thrown into this multi-dimensional world where all these ideas came. And I went back to saying that the voice of truth and reason will prevail. And we need to trust in our democracy. And I think that this is great what's happening because at the end what's going to come out of this is, is a clean version of what things should be like. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gutierrez. It's a great interview. Thank, Thank you. you.